if you consider migrating or using multiple clouds, it's how do you replicate? It's not just about moving data or using a slightly different product that does the same thing with a different API call. No, it's about how do I make sure that all the policies I've enforced for my cost control, for my access control, for all those compliance that now I'm in enterprise, I have more and more. I want to make sure it's uniformous across all those platforms. This is Sovereign DBAS Decoded, a podcast for IT leaders and implementers looking to reliably scale database ops while maintaining control of their data stack. In each episode, we join industry experts to discuss the what and why of sovereignty and how you can implement the Sovereign DBAS concept of your own using open source databases, deployment models, and tooling. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sovereign DBAS Decoded, brought to you by Several Nines. I'm Vinny Jusseri, co-founder and CEO of Several Nines. So in today's episode, I'll discuss the relationship between data sovereignty, sovereign cloud, and sovereign DBAS with Antoine Cotier, co-founder and CEO of Exascale, a Swiss cloud provider. So welcome, and thanks for joining us today, Antoine. Thank you, Vinay. Thank you for the invitation. That's a topic that matters a lot to us. So happy to join. Great, great. So can you tell us a little bit about you and, and what you do? Sure. So as you said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of, of Exoscale. But before that, I mean, I'm an IT engineer by, by training. I worked in the telco business for a long time and then uh, created the first public cloud, actually, which was dedicated to the press and media business before launching uh, Exoscale. The company we, we launched uh, here in uh, Switzerland, in Lausanne, back in 2011 and took us two years to bring out to the market. So we just celebrated 2013, 2023. We celebrated earlier this year our 10-year anniversary of the of the Exoscale product out there on the on the on the market. Yeah. So it's going strong and we we are believing uh, in this journey that the, the cloud can be uh, regional, can be uh, closer and made in Europe with uh, seven data centers that we are pushing closer to uh, to our users in Switzerland, in Germany, in Austria, and in Bulgaria for the moment. Excellent. All right. So if we zoom back a little bit, right, if we kind of like, you know, rewind, we are in 2010 kind of thing, right? The cloud is a new thing. You know, it's IT on tap. You can just rent you know, computing resources in the cloud. There's no real legal or compliance concerns you know, data privacy, it's kind of a new thing. So, so people are not really asking those questions, right? It's more about how do I take advantage of this new thing, you know, which give us uh, elastic resources and I pay for what I use, right? But if you fast forward a decade, the world has changed. There's new privacy laws. There's a growing, you could say, counter movement against globalization. And um, data sovereignty is becoming a hotter and hotter topic, you know, topic. So, so, so before we dive into the details, let me ask you this. If there was one thing you had the power to change in the European data sovereignty space, what would it be? Hey, tough question. Tough question. I mean, one thing, and I, I, I mean, we can attribute the, here a lot of uh, success to our neighbors across the Atlantic in the US is that what they have the courage to do is they're much more patriot in the consumption and in the spending. So the the Amazon and Google and Microsoft they they've achieved a, a, a so fast growth and etc. Because the products are generally good, but also because the government and the society as a whole has sent them millions in, in deals and in consumption so that they could rapidly scale and uh, become those de facto standards that they are over there in, um, in the US. What we lack here in Europe, because of our difference of cultures and, and this willingness and maybe naivete, uh, 
it's that I mean everybody should be allowed to play and etc. So we um, our, our, our leaders are not enforcing to consume uh, exclusively from uh, from US uh, EU um, vendors. That we don't have we haven't yet benefited from I mean that uh, in house uh, buy from from government from public institutions that has happened a lot across the Atlantic. So yeah, a bit more courage. A bit more patriotism would be uh, would be my ask. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's hard to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I will agree. I mean, you know, I think um, if if we look a little bit at, at how the cloud providers have the big ones, at least, you know, Amazon, you know, AWS, they had a very strong, you know, internal customer, right? Obviously, Microsoft. I mean, it's you know, huge, massive company with you know resources. Google is a very big company, but in terms of market share, they are quite behind. You would say, you know, Amazon and uh, and mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft. But if you think about it, even a company like you know Google, with those resources they have, right? Even they are kind of struggling to you know sort of catch up with with AWS and and Microsoft. And then in China, we have you know we have two hyperscalers there, right? So heavily funded, you know, by the by the government in a way. So yeah, I mean, I would I would probably agree that we are more split in Europe, so to speak. And yeah, uh, most of the market is taken by the by the hyperscalers, right? So let's let's dive let's dive right in. Sovereignty, right? So what is it all about? What is do, you know data sovereignty as commonly understood, and and is it important, right? So the discussion you know revolves around privacy regulations, compliance. But is that it, right? Is it not about ownership or control fundamentally? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and it's it's a very trendy topic, and it's it's. Uh, I mean, in twenty three, I've I've seen the debate. I mean, really catch up and, and elevate to a point where here I was at a conference uh, earlier this year in um, in Geneva. I mean, Geneva is, is super interesting because it has all those. It has, I mean, United Nations, it has all those uh, NGOs, so there's a lot of international discussions. There was this conference bringing all the, most of the Swiss cantons together, uh, the politics there, and it was interesting because for the first time, uh, there was a consortium of um, uh, directors from the, of the, they call this digital directors of each, uh, each cantons. They federated together and they 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 mandated studies and they came up with a definition of what's the the digital sovereignty, and, and I think it's good because I mean it's first time the politics politicians uh, grab the topic and try to put words uh, for it. And uh, I'll do a trial and and sorry I need to 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 look at my second screen for this because it's uh, the actual text is in the is in French, but they've defined this as the ability of authorities, of politicians, to maintain the strategic autonomy and to be able to use and control in an autonomous way the material means and immaterial aspects of digital services which impact economy, society, and democracy. And I think the last aspect is, is super in interesting because we always associate it to economy. Oh, it's, we, we don't have full control. We can be, uh, but they also judge this as uh, democracy. I mean, the freedom of uh, selecting our leaders, of the people uh, being uh, in control of their own, uh, own, own will and, and destiny. So I think there's a realization that the, the digital world has, I mean, uh, so much impact now in our lives that it goes far beyond just uh, market shares and valuation of this or that company or who import or export uh, balances between uh, continents and, and countries. So I, I, I've grown fond of this, uh, of this definition and um, I buy to it, so the, the autonomy and, and control. If we take an analogy with whatever other infrastructure business, I mean, would we give the management of our roads, of our water to, I mean, uh, uh, to, to full different uh, country and have absolutely no say on 
I mean, how much water, how clean the water, where the water comes from or goes to. I don't think so. So why do we do it with data? Why do we do it with um, computing uh, power and also with software? Because it's it's uh, that's also what this definition says. It's it's not only just the the material pieces. It's uh, what um, binds it, and what binds it is the is is the software that um, our communities are building together. Right, right. So we'll save that discussion a bit for later uh, yes. around, you know, critical infrastructure, right? The cloud as, 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 you know, critical infrastructure in a way. So, so let me come back to that. But um, let me ask you this. Have you seen your customers' thoughts evolve, right, around this sovereignty thing, right? So what are the business risks they are highlighting for wanting to run on a national cloud instead of one of the big, you know, hyperscalers? What we what we've seen, we've seen uh, some some most of the larger prospects that we've been engaged to recently. There's the NIST two directive has been uh, uh, is now in force in, in Europe, and there's um, it made some of the most advanced and mature companies realize that yes, there's a risk, and it would be might be a good thing at least to adopt. Uh, dual stack strategy or have a, have a way to be able to uh, switch to uh, to another platform if need be. So we're getting into much more engagements lately based on that uh, on the fact that there's a, a new uh, this new regulatory frame of the NIST 2 directive. Uh, it's a bit too early to say is it going to be fully embraced? Yes or no? And uh, the first uh, also, just like GDPR, the first fines and the first uh, things from the from the EU commissions have yet to be uh, to be executed. So we'll see what this leads to. But um, the it's in the talks. Right, right. So we have the you know hyperscaler versus national cloud aspect, right? Which is important with respect to you know national privacy laws. But is a national cloud the final destination for your customers, right? Do you see a place for hybrid, right? Being cloud smart instead of cloud first strategy? Of course. I think uh, certain aspects of data applications are already public. They're already out there. They need to be pushed to users that sit uh, all over the world. So it will be also a competitive disadvantage if Europe would force all its companies to exclusively use only national clouds. As I mean, you would be, you would have constraints. How do you reach users that are across the globe if you're you're constrained to uh, to just a few locations here in Europe? Doesn't make doesn't make sense. But for certain uh, aspects of uh, of data and applications, making sure that the road or the water pipe cannot go away, like we were uh, doing this analogy before, I think it's fundamental. So yeah, hybrid. In the sense of multi, is uh, he's here for to stay? I think it's 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 the way hybrid has uh, has transformed from uh, on-prem to just one hyperscalers. We're seeing uh, one, two hyperscalers and uh, and a third option. Mm-hmm. And we like when this option is us, but <laughs> it's, of course <laughs> it can be it can be any of uh, of our uh, European colleagues as well. I mean, hybrid, there's, there's a lot of talk, right? If you look at uh, most of the surveys, most companies are using, you know, a combination of some of their own data centers and, you know, uh, different public clouds. But the question is, in practice, how feasible is it, right, to have a real multi-cloud or slash hybrid cloud strategy, right? I mean, if you think about it, the services offered by hyperscalers, they are usually not compatible with each other or with whatever services there are on the national cloud, right? You have egress fees, right? These are the charges that customers pay to transfer data, you know, their data out of the cloud. And, you know, hyperscalers, usually they set them significantly higher, right? Than as compared to other cloud providers. I mean, you know, or we know that there are many data centers that you can just rent where they don't even charge for egress, right? And then you have committed spend right? Which in a way it makes sense, right? You do a deal, you will consume, you know, uh, 
quite you know quite some amount of of you know sort of infrastructure over two three years, and then you get a discount, which is a very normal thing to do, right? But then you still have to pay that whether you you know whether you use it or not. That's the thing. That's the catch, right? So so you know you get a discount, whatever <laughs> percentage. So hopefully you also use all the actual commit that you you know that you've put down, right? So 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 then in a way you know the customer is incentivized to use one single hyperscaler. Of right? course. Right. So so it is kind of a vicious circle because you know the customer finds it harder to switch or to use other clouds, right? In a way, the, you know, the hyperscaler has you by the balls, as they say, right? So good luck in negotiating a better deal next time around, right? So hyperscaler dominance continues, right? It's like this, this giant tree that kind of, you know, sucks all the water and the nutrients, right, from the earth. So, so there's little left for others, right? So, you know, my question is, how feasible is this current landscape? Right, because it's not, it's not very helpful in. Well, it's not prone to let smaller players grow in a way and flourish. Yeah, you're right, and I mean this lock-in effect is. Um, I mean, it's that's, that's their play, and it's quite effective. I, I, I must say, I would add a third dimension to to the reasons that you listed: e egress. There's, uh, there's the, 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 the commits, et cetera. So both more like financial aspects. But what we see is usually those customers, they've invested a lot of time configuring all the policies and, you know, the IM of those platforms. So it's not just if you consider migrating or using multiple um, clouds, it's how do you replicate It's not just about moving data or using a slightly different product but th that does the same uh, thing with a different API call. No, it's about how do I make sure that all the policies I've enforced for my cost control, for my access control, for all those compliance that now I'm in enterprise, I have more and more. I want to make sure it's, it's uniformous across all those platforms. I mean, it, it's, it's, a nightmare, uh, it's a nightmare to do. And up to recently, very, very few, to be honest, providers who, I mean, were on par in terms of uh, features in that, uh, in, in that regard. So uh, if I take the example of Exoscale, of course, we don't have all the features in terms of products, but we have, uh, I mean, most of the, the, the base products. So something that runs on Hyperscaler, you can make it run on, uh, on Exoscale. But our previous version of the uh, IEM was, I would say, simple in the sense that it was basic and far from what the hyperscalers were uh, were able to offer. So we've just recently progressed on that in the hope, I mean, complexifying a bit our product, which we don't like very much, but also in the hope, okay, someone can at least define the policy, the same policy at an hyperscaler, uh, at Exoscale, and then maybe make it easier to get that multi-cloud aspect. And then what we What we like, I mean, try to educate our customers to do is, is to try to use more standards, external control planes. So, so just like, I mean, uh, yours from, I mean, the, the cluster control is a good example. Or, or, I mean, you don't have to use the Kubernetes manager from, uh, from the managed Kubernetes offerings from cloud providers. You can very well also go with your, OpenShift or Rancher or whatever distribution you you like, and so by standardizing on a on a lower common denominator, it makes it easier, at least to uh, to switch. But as soon as you get trapped into advanced and custom uh, custom products that only exist at one place, it's it's very very hard to get that uh, that uh, hybrid or multi cloud equation running at least in a meaning, meaningful way of course i mean all companies they will try to say yes and just have a, a tiny application run on a separate platform but uh, the, the balance is uh, would be off i mean this is something that you see as well so yeah i i you know i do think so as well i i think everybody says that you know they, yeah we use you know two to three you know, I don't know, at least two hyperscalers, maybe, you know, at least a couple of, let's say, smaller cloud providers, more local, right? But then if 90% 90, 90 of your spend actually goes into, you know, 
uh, one of the hyperscalers, and then you just have some random small systems. Yes, you can say on paper I'm using multiple clouds, but you know most of it is actually just mm -hmm. one cloud. That's 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 kind of the thing, right? How many applications actually are truly multi-cloud, right? With the setups, with the egress fees, with all these you know issues around IAM and you know having to configure two different platforms in a way to get it to work. I mean, it's 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 so much work that uh, yeah. So, but if we switch a little bit, you know, database as a service, right? It's kind of a you know terme du jour, right? And but that's really database automation. Right. And database automation is not necessarily synonymous with, you know, with DBAS, right? There's arguably multiple ways of, you know, automating your databases. So looking at your, you know, your own customers or prospects, I mean, are you seeing any, you know, let's say any prospects, you know, asking about implementing alternative models on top of your infrastructure, right? For example, are they building their own automation? On you know on top of IAS, uh, you know what are what are the kind of models that you're seeing? Okay, so first, I mean we are in infrastructure as, as a service provider, so not all customers tell us what they do, <laughs> and, and and we we don't um, we don't eavesdrop on their on their workload to try to find out that that, that would be out of the our terms and conditions. So the only uh, insights I have is, is is from the conversations in which we we directly um, we, we directly engage uh, with. There's a variety of things. I'm not sure I can be I can give you a very meaningful answer on um, uh, on this one. We are seeing uh, quite some success with our own DPAS uh, database as a service product. That's for sure. We know also there's plenty of workloads that are still being run on either a traditional way or with an external orchestration layer or, or, or control plane layer that we don't know uh, we don't know of but we can see and feel that there's uh, some backups happening and etc so trying uh, some east west uh, traffic between uh, between compute between our plug storage uh, so so for sure this is uh, this is happening yeah okay okay and I guess, I mean, you know, I guess one such model could be something like Kubernetes, where in a way the, you know, the customer might get a bit more control over all the things that, that help them run their infrastructure and their databases. That could be one level of automation slash encapsulation and isolation, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this Kubernetes is doing wonders in that field. I mean, because it's uh, standardizing. A bit the platform across uh, across vendors, so so we're seeing great adoption in all the flavors. As I was mentioning before, whether it's our own um, SKS or scalable Kubernetes service, it's, it's a full managed uh, Kubernetes control plane on top of, of Exascale, or people that deploy their own vanilla Kubernetes clusters or um, flavored clusters with uh, the the ranchers and and OpenShift uh, of this world. This is uh, draining more and more, um, uh, more and more workloads, and we, we are seeing also people trying to use the this orchestration layer to to run uh, databases, um, not to to um, sometimes mix results, but it's uh, definitely a definitely a trend. And what we can say, I mean, I have a, a nice figure for you is that I mean, all the Kubernetes related uh, workload in the space of two years, they've started, they've gone from zero almost, to now, I mean, they weight 20% of all the compute workloads that are running on, on Exoscale. So it's just to say that the, uh, an adoption rate as fast as this is, is just um, unseen before. So it's, it's really a trend that we are seeing on our, in our data centers with Exoscale. Yeah, yeah. So we've spoken, you know, about how companies are thinking about sovereignty and how they're using different models to achieve that, right? Yes. So do you think sovereignty will become more important, right, to them in the future? Or are we today at the peak? I think we're not yet at the peak, okay? As I was saying before, we had the NIS2 directive. It's a discussion that sparkled uh, in 2023. And um, more regulations coming our way also from the, the Europe European Commission's. Unfortunately, some a bit delayed because there's a lot of lobbying, as we can uh, 
we can imagine, but there's a there's the promise of from ENISA of uh, the EUCS, uh, so a framework for cloud services in uh, in Europe, and some also digital uh, acts that are uh, that are in the works. So the regulatory frame is uh, is moving, and I think we'll we'll bring more and more discussion. So it's definitely uh, trendy, not at the not at the peak yet. Because the awareness is is not here everywhere, my sentiment is it's with more the mature uh, companies, the ones that are that really have a strong uh, a security posture, not widely um, uh, spread yet. So, thank you for doing the, the podcast because it, it helps uh, it helps uh, pro- pro- propagating the, the the message and at least the awareness that yeah you you need to think about it. Uh, you need to decide where do you where do you Put yourself on that line of uh, sovereignty vis-à-vis of your business. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think you know, it is. I do agree with you. I think it's it is a uh, it is something that will become more important. We're probably not at the peak, but um, and we kind of touched upon it earlier in this conversation. You know, cloud computing as critical infrastructure. Right. We talk about because, you know, we talk about uh, democracy. We talk about not just, you know, economy. A, there was a third one. The so- Econo- society. Yeah. Society, it's, economy, yeah. society and democracy. Yes. Yeah. Civil. So um, and, uh, you know, just like water, energy, water, energy, highways, bridges, railways and so on. Right. So what are your thoughts there? I mean, is the cloud part today of critical infrastructure as it is and as such? If it is, should it be regulated? The tough question, though. <laughs> regulated, yes and no. Should it be? Could it be standardized? I mean, if you just I mean, you, you took the electricity example just just right before. Of course, I mean, we expect if you buy any appliance in Europe, you expect this to be two hundred and twenty volts. Okay, so, so that it, it, it's just you plug it, and the socket has a certain shape. At least in your country, you plug it; it works, and not uh, different shapes and different voltages and etc. And then in the US, they have their own plug format and their own uh, uh, voltage. But at least it works everywhere. So uh, we, we need to at least get to that to that level where you can you can. Plug and play everywhere, at least with a certain scale, a certain geographical di- di- dimension. Then, fully, fully regulated and just only one provider, maybe not. Some competition is is, is always uh, is always good. Should it be should in addition to with standards, should have uh, guide guidelines and and uh, guide rails with more certifications and. And, uh, and normative ways from uh, for, from the legislature legislators. This, I think, yes, we could have some more, so that it's not the the jungle or that everybody hides behind. Oh, I'm ISO this and that. But what does it really mean in the pack? Because you could very well certify, uh, I mean, just only part of your business and not the platform as a whole. So it's 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 and it's only for specialists. So. This transparency is uh, is not there yet, and could be uh, there could be uh, at least a mandate to make it clearer so that people can compare offerings much uh, straighter and have a default uh, compatibility of okay they can expect Kubernetes to behave the same way at <laughs> at all those locations or a database to behave also the same way across the across the locations. That, that would be my dream. I don't know if we will uh, succeed as a as an industry, as a whole. Well, we should. I mean, you know, we have no choice, right? So, so you know, I think, in a way, if we look at, um, you know, I guess, you know, data sovereignty, in one expression or another, it will continue to increase in significance, right? From like ten years ago, ten, fifteen years ago, when it started, people didn't really think about, you know, the consequences of using the cloud. And just like any other technology, right, it gets more and more regulated with time, right? So, you know, even AI, if we look at what's, what's happening today, you know, there's, there's the same discussions there, right? So how can solution providers, right, support organizations, you know, looking to enact more control over their data? 
you know, whether it be through their infrastructure or their database, etc. Well, I think I mean, data means I'm stateful. So I think for all the application part, it's a trend that's that's been uh, running for many years. I mean, with running infrastructure as code and deploying more applications in an automated way. It's something that's now, I mean, all the DevOps <laughs> also culture has, has made its way and it's it's now something that's uh, adopted quite and more. And I think with uh, data and more precisely with databases, we're still in that moment where databases used to be, I mean, very special beast that had a special name. So the, the pet versus cattle <laughs> dilemma that was with virtual machines 10 years ago is still uh, in some aspects a bit true with databases. So helping customers really separate protecting the state, protecting the data from the uh, data operation is still something that's ongoing. Not everybody has um, fully embraced it. And I think, I mean, our both our companies with uh, DBAS offerings, they uh, can really help our customers or our users achieve that, that additional bit of control in terms of, okay, my backups, they're in check. I know how to upgrade. I know how to do blue-green deployments, etc. Not only with just my app, but with my uh, with my databases as, uh, as, as well. So we still need to finish that part of uh, transition on the market and educating the all the all the customers so that by default applications can be designed in that uh, in that way right okay okay so just to summarize you know what would be your you know since we're a database company you know we do database ops but you know giving it to you as a as a you know cloud provider what would be your recommendation to enterprises right when it comes to devising a new database strategy? I would say, to recap on what we've said uh, so before, avoiding lock-ins, okay? So choose a, choose a database, a data platform that you know you'll be able to run on-prem, you'll be able to run on any cloud you, you, you choose because that cloud infrastructure or your customers, that's, that's the end customer of a, of a company, can change, can move, and new markets can open, and you need to have this ability to deploy, redeploy, and get closer to your users. Uh, so when you buy into a technology, make sure that you, you have some, some portability with that technology. So either use vanilla open source uh, flavors or, or a control plane that will enable you to... Um, to, to, to deploy it to deploy it anywhere I think uh, that's uh, that will be in the technical aspects one of the, the critical ones and then if you're selecting to go um, uh, out there and to get it as a service make sure that with every, every provider that you select I mean you still retain the full data ownership and that you have also rights whatever happens with your provider to data reversibility so that you can retrieve your data if something bad happens contractually. I mean, you disagree, payment issues, what, whatever the world would be made of uh, in, a, in a few years to come, that you have this legal right, a contractual right to, to get your data back as a, as a data controller. Because in the end, it's, it's, it's about control, it's about autonomy. So you can only achieve that if you enforce these not just technically, but also in your contracts with uh, with your solution providers. Okay, yeah. Imagine somebody holding your ransom, you know, on your data. That would be pretty, pretty, uh, yeah, pretty crazy. Yes. And but... okay, Antoine. Well, <laughs> you know, thank you. Uh, it's been it's been great, right? Getting a a sort of Swiss perspective on data sovereignty. And that's it for today, folks. See you all for the next episode. Thank you. Thanks for checking out this episode of Sovereign DBAS Decoded, brought to you by Several Nines, the leader in intelligent multi-cloud database orchestration solutions for open source and source available databases. Like what you've heard in this episode? Then just follow the Sovereign DBAS Decoded podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcast or visit severalnines.com slash podcast to get access to all the latest episodes.